All right, guys, our final set of video notes for this unit involves psychoactive drugs. So we're going to be covering brain functioning and the physical and psychological impact that each one of these drugs has. So obviously it's very important that we gain a really good understanding of what they are and what they do. So we classify anything as a psychoactive drug that involves a, an effect on our consciousness and particularly that alters our perceptions and our moods, okay? So even caffeine, we perceive caffeine to kind of be relatively harmless, but caffeine is considered to be a psychoactive drug and a person can actually go through physical withdrawal symptoms if they don't get that into their system after uh, an extended period of developing a tolerance and dependence to that. So any kind of substance, chemical substance, that alters your perceptions and mood in a, you know, while you're in a conscious state is considered to be a psychoactive drug. So let's talk dependence, addiction, and withdrawal. In order to develop a dependence on a drug, you have to first take a look at the concept of tolerance, okay? So the more that you expose yourself to a drug, the higher your tolerance, okay? So you need higher and higher levels of the drug to get the desired effect that you want from it. And so as a result, a person can develop physical and psychological dependence to the drug and therefore an addiction to it. So if you look at this visual right here, you'll see you know, the, the range of the drug's effect from little to big and the drug dosage from small to large. So if the initial exposure, that first exposure to the drug gives you a relatively large effect in you know, a, a moderate dose, so to speak, after repeated exposure to it, after consistent amounts of ingesting that psycho psychoactive drug, uh, you end up needing more of the drug, a larger dose, to produce the same effect. So I'll use myself in this uh, regard. I've admitted to you guys that I am a bit of a caffeine addict. I definitely need a lot of coffee to be able to get me alert and awake to start my morning since I get up so early and I struggle so much with sleep. So, beginning of the school year, I don't need nearly as much coffee to keep me awake and alert uh, as I do say right now, as we're in, you know, as we're heading towards Thanksgiving break and we've been in school for a while now and we're all starting to kind of feel that drag, like, oh, we need that break. It takes me on average about three or four cups of coffee now to feel, um, you know, relatively awake and alert, whereas at the beginning of the school year it took me maybe half of a cup and I was fine. So that's what we mean when we say that we're, you know, seeing a person so that's what we mean when we say that a person can develop a tolerance to a drug and therefore lead to dependence and addiction to that. So when we experience withdrawal, this happens when a person stops taking a drug after they have developed an addiction to it, okay? You can have very undesirable effects with, with withdrawal. Oftentimes it can be physical issues, um, stomach cramping, aches, uh, nausea, for example, some person, um, some people can develop headaches um, or I issues with that. Dependence is when the absence of the drug leads to these withdrawal symptoms and these feelings of physical pain, this you know intense craving for the drug itself. That is physical dependence uh, and negative emotions. Um, so you know feeling like you cannot function you know psychologically speaking without that drug. That is psychological dependence. It's very important that we make sure when we're discussing psychoactive drugs that we address misconceptions about issues of addiction. There seems to be this perception out there with regard to addiction, this craving for a chemical substance, irregardless of the negative side effects and consequences that can have on us, whether those be physical or psychological. We seem to feel as if addiction is, a, you know, a part of just trying a drug once, that if a person were to have a drug that's, you know, pretty high on you know, the, the warning scale for us, like heroin or crystal meth, that very quickly it will go about causing the person to become very, very addicted very quickly and very soon. That's not necessarily the case. We found through research that in actuality, uh, only 10% of people who try drugs end up becoming dependent and addicted to those drugs. 
So that common sense kind of mentality that drugs can very quickly cause you to become addicted to them aren't necessarily the case. Another kind of mentality that's out there is that addiction can't be overcome voluntarily. Um, that it, it takes a very, very long period of time for people to get over addictions. Uh, you know, they need to go through you know, large amounts of help and rehab treatments and things along those lines. For many people that can be the case, but that's not always going to you know, be the situation. Uh, many people have been able to overcome addictions that they have to psychoactive drugs on their own. Um, and so, you know, there very much is that, again, that misconception that needs to be addressed with regard to psychoactive drug abuse. A third misconception is that addiction is not any different than other repetitive kind of pleasure-seeking behaviors. That if you have a drug addiction, it's part of an addictive personality. And so you'll become addicted to other kinds of things other than drugs to replace them. That doesn't always seem to be the case for most people. More often than not, there's, you know, what leads to drug addiction and dependence is this feeling that, um, you know, that there is an underlying problem that leads the person to that, whether it be depression, difficulties at home, inabilities to deal with, you know, everyday experiences in life, and so many feel the necessity to use drugs to kind of escape those realities. So. It's not enough to say that a person that has developed an addiction to a drug is also going to develop other kind of addictive, pleasure-seeking behaviors as well. So let's talk our first set of category within psychoactive drugs. Depressants are the psychoactive drugs that are out there that will reduce neural activity that is going on in your brain and in your nervous system. So it will slow down your body functions, hence why it is called a depressant. There are three types that you need to know within this category of depressants. You need to know about alcohol, barbiturates, and opiates. So we'll go into each one of these a little bit more in depth right now. Alcohol is probably one of the most widely known depressant psychoactive drugs. Alcohol in low doses does tend to relax a person, so uh, we see a lowering of inhibitions and judgment call for those that have ingested a low amount of alcohol. So it slows down your sympathetic nervous system. Um, in higher doses though, the reaction time for those that have ingested this are slower, speech is slurred, um, and performance in terms of motor skills deteriorates. So this is oftentimes why if there is a person who is suspected of driving under the influence of alcohol, they'll carry out motor functioning tests where you have to bring your fingers and touch your nose, where you have to walk in a straight line. Uh, because if you have ingested alcohol in high doses, your reaction times are slow. Um, any of you guys that have been to a party where alcohol has been ingested, you know, the, this is very much considered to be a rite of passage for many teenagers as they go through high school. That, you know, parties, it's not a party unless it's got large amounts of alcohol and people are ingesting it. You are, I'm sure, are very well aware of witnessing issues with this when you watch another person who is under the influence of alcohol demonstrate these issues of lowered inhibitions, lowered decision making processes, um, and just low motor skills in general. What a lot of people also don't necessarily think of in the moment is that alcohol can affect your memory because what it does is it disrupts the processing of recent information and recent events with your hippocampus and transferring that into long-term stored memory in the temporal lobe. It also reduces your self-awareness and it focuses your attention on the immediate situation rather than kind of the lasting future consequences of things. So oftentimes this is when we find that people will the next day when they wake up kind of look at things like, oh gosh, why didn't I think about these issues? Why didn't I think about the consequences? And a lot of times that's just because of the physical impact that alcohol can have on a person. Over time, it is very, very obvious what alcohol can do to the brain and its functioning. You see up here to the left this visual of a woman with alcoholism. The ventricles in her brain are expanding, so she is losing brain functioning in comparison to a scan of a woman who has no alcoholism 
uh, in her system. So she's not struggling with this alcohol dependency and addiction. You can see down here these other ventricles get larger um, and these areas of the brain just are not functioning in the manner that they would without that alcohol dependency. The body's reaction to alcohol does differ based off of gender, okay? So um, it usually takes about an hour for your body to metabolize alcohol that is in one drink. So that would be uh, one ounce of an 80 proof liquor, so this would be a shot, four ounces of wine, or 12 ounces of beer, that would be a bottle. Women are going to metabolize this alcohol more slowly than men will. And the reason behind that is men have more muscle mass. You could have a man and a woman at equal height and equal weight drink the exact same amount of alcohol, but the woman would still get drunk faster because the muscle mass in men helps to metabolize the alcohol out of your system more quickly. Now, barbiturates are a second kind of category within depressant psychoactive drugs. Barbiturates aren't really that heavily prescribed anymore or used, but it is still important that you are aware of them. Um, more common names are Nembutal, Secanol, Amatol. Barbiturates were originally prescribed to help people kind of relax, um, so kind of deal with anxiety or to help them sleep. Um, they, they were originally prescribed for people with insomnia, for example, uh, but they are very, very easy to become addicted to, and so that's why um, use of them has gone down quite drastically in terms of you know it being prescribed by doctors. Now, most of the time, people will be prescribed something like Valium, which students are a little bit more aware of um, to help them deal with you know, anxiety or... Um, sleep issues. But barbiturates are very similar in terms of their effects to alcohol. Uh, so it will depress your central nervous system's activity. It will lead to possible impairment in memory and judgment calls. Uh, so that, that's really what you need to know in terms of being able to differentiate it from alcohol. And then a final depressant category is opiates and there are multiple subsets within opiates. Um, opium and its derivatives, so morphine, heroin, and uh, many of the prescriptive narcotics that are out there now that you guys are familiar with, uh, Vicodin, Oxycontin, Roxycodone, uh, what they do is they are depressants, so they suppress central nervous system activity, they depress neural activity in general, and they lessen pain and anxiety. And so they very much kind of have a tendency to mimic uh, neurotransmitter functioning in your brain, particularly endorphins where narcotics are concerned. Opiates in general are just very highly addictive. Opiates come from the poppy plant. So you can see this right here. Uh, if you've ever witnessed or watched The Wizard of Oz, with Judy Garland in it, you'll see that they're at one point just kind of running through a poppy plant and they get really sleepy and tired and just very, uh, their mood and their activity level just very, very much decreases. Uh, it's because of the, the poppy plants that they're running through. So let's talk heroin as a subset of this. Heroin is a depressant, okay, so it operates as an opiate. Uh, it is used to get a very short-lived high, okay, so it uh, very much Im mimics um, endorphins and kind of that um, pleasure principle that comes from endorphins in your brain. The high will last for about three to five hours and then you will very much be presented with another craving for a, f a second fix. And the need then progressively develops to a, a person developing a higher tolerance. So you need more and more and more of a heroin dosage to get the desired outcomes. So you can develop really high levels of physical withdrawal symptoms to heroin. A way to help treat a person that develops heroin addiction is to use a chemical called methadone. It mimics some of the aspects of heroin, but it is not nearly as physically addictive as heroin itself. Um, at the dosage that uh, you know we can prescribe them to the individuals as they're attempting to wean themselves off of heroin, it reduces the intense physical cravings that uh, heroin typically provides to a person. Problem is, 
you could still become addicted to methadone as well. So it's a very slippery slope and it has to be very, very heavily monitored.